Good day, everyone, and welcome to the third and final webinar in the Supply Chains Reloaded series brought to you by Maersk and Kuninagel. My name is Peter Tershwell, Vice President at the Maritime and Trade Division of IHS Market, where I lead the Journal of Commerce and the TPM Conference. The focus of today's webinar is increasing resilience through sustainability. And when we talk about sustainable supply chains, there is really one issue that towers head and shoulders above everything else, and that is greenhouse gas emissions and the growing pressure that retailers, consumer brands, and other shippers are under to reduce the carbon footprint in their supply chains and the growing pressure that carriers and logistics providers are under to respond to those demands. Given that a large portion of what moves inside ocean containers are consumer goods of various kinds, containers is obviously the segment of the maritime industry that is most closely connected to the end consumer. And thus, it is not surprising that as consumers become more aware of the greenhouse gas footprint of the goods they buy, the demands on the supply chain, including all the various participants to address their concerns, will only grow. And that is absolutely what we're seeing. It is therefore not surprising at all that Maersk, the world's largest container carrier, would be out ahead of the industry in committing to become zero carbon in all of its operations by 2050. Remember that the IMO committed to only a 50% reduction in carbon emissions by 2050. And also, Maersk has committed to, to deploy the first zero carbon vessel onto the water by 2030, less than a decade from now. And the ambitious commitments by Maersk fit into a broader context where we see the private sector becoming increasingly unwilling to wait on government action on climate change, but rather wanting to see meaningful progress now. Increasingly, ocean carriers and freight forwarders like Kuhn and Nagel are being pulled into meetings with corporate sustainability officers who are demanding data and transparency, all of which is positive. But the reality is this, that meaningful greenhouse gas reduction in container supply chains will only happen as a result of collective action and governmental policies, including incentives onto the industry. And in this context, two things need to happen. We have to bring down emissions now with the existing fleet and fuels still in place, and we need to determine one or more zero carbon fuels that can be deployed at scale with the goal of eventually phasing out greenhouse gas emissions from, from the shipping industry entirely. That is both the stated goal of the IMO and an urgent challenge to all of us and our organizations. So the question really for us today is how do we get there? What strategy should be employed? How do we make meaningful progress? How do we understand sustainability as a supply chain imperative? And ultimately, where do we go from here? What makes this webinar so special is that we have actually the precise people on the face of the earth who are best positioned to address these questions. I'm really pumping you guys up now. I, I hope you can tell that. Uh, so uh, first, we have Otto Schacht, the uh, Executive Vice President of Sea Logistics at Kuhn and Agel, which is the world's largest ocean freight forwarder. And I do not think it is inaccurate at all to say that Otto has been the most outspoken freight forwarder on the subject of decarbonization over a number of years now. Uh, we have Sanjay uh, uh, Vasudevan, uh, the head of key client management and sustainability at Maersk, the world's largest container shipping company, which, as I mentioned, has made by far the most ambitious commitments on decarbonization among shipping companies, as I alluded to earlier. We also have Peter Stokes, the chairman of the Global Maritime Forum, which is driving a very ambitious decarbonization decarbonization agenda focused on areas including ship finance, research and development, and most recently, an initiative that leverages the considerable power of bulk shipping charters to drive change. And finally, and I would have to say our guest of honor today is uh, Boris Herman, uh, the a professional skipper and sustainability ambassador for uh, uh, Team Malaysia. And we're especially honored to have you, Boris, with us as uh, I believe you said that this is your final media appearance before setting off this Sunday on what is without question the world's most challenging sailing race, the Vendi Global Nonstop Solo Round the World Race. So a special welcome to you, Skipper Herman. Thank you for joining us. Uh, in terms of our agenda today for the webinar, we're going to address the following issues. Uh, is sustainability the next frontier in supply chain? What strategies can business adopt to increase sustainability in supply chains? How does how does consumer opinion play a role in business decisions to have a more sustainable approach to supply chains? What is global engagement and collaboration across industries 
excuse me, why is it essential uh, to uh, to enable a sustainable supply chains? Um, but first, let's set the scene uh, a bit for our dialogue by hearing from our speakers. Uh, uh, Skipper, on your boat called Explore, which is sponsored, among others, by Kuna Nagel, uh, you have a phrase which is, a, it's a race we must win. And I don't think that you are just referring to yourself winning the Bendy Global Race. Uh, can you explain what you mean by that? Yes, um, thank you. Um, we are in a race that we need to win, that we must win. We cannot afford not to win it. Um, the, the, the race against time that we are all in, in at the matter of climate change, and uh, in order to, to win, we need to act now, and that's what this discussion is about. So I think it's a good, good slogan to open this, to kick start this discussion with. Thank you. Terrific, thank you. And and Peter, from, from from your point of view, I mean, when we talk, you know, there's been a, a lot of talk about decarbonization uh, globally at the IMO level. Uh, you folks at the Global Maritime Forum are addressing it in the area, as I had mentioned, in the area of ship finance. Now you're addressing it in the area of, of, of bulk shipping. You've done work on research and development on the getting to thir getting to 2030 coalition. Um, but when we come to containerized supply chains, uh, how do you how do you approach this issue? What are what are the big areas of progress that you see being needed? Well, you know, I think that's a very good question. Um, the, the difference, obviously, between the sea cargo charter, which is the the, the bulk um, cargo owners initiative, which was was launched recently under the auspices of the Global Maritime Forum, and uh, the container shipping industry is is obviously that container shipping lines are common carriers. Typically, bulk vessels carry a cargo for one for one uh, customer, sometimes for a considerable period. Um, so, getting um, coordination between the major liquid and bulk charters is not easy, but it's relatively easier. I think this um, webinar today is extremely interesting, which is why I was so keen to be part of it, because clearly there does need to be collaboration um, between the different sectors in the maritime value chain if progress is to be made in an equitable way uh, in order to arrive at scalable um, use of zero carbon um, emission fuels within the next 10 to 15 years. So getting the shipper community engaged with the uh, carriers, with the financiers, with the insurers for that matter, because the insurance industry is now also getting involved in this, uh, is going to be critical. Um, because, of course, there is no zero carbon uh, fuel available commercially at the moment. That ha We have to get there. And then uh, first movers have to be encouraged, incentivized to do something about it. And that will require collaboration between the different parties involved along the chain. Thank you, Peter. Uh, Otto, if we were to turn to you, uh, one of the points that, that you've made is that you are, in fact, beginning to see shippers come to the table and beginning to uh, express themselves and assert themselves on this question of decarbonization and container shipping. Uh, could you give us sort of a feel from the front lines of, of what you're seeing and, and, and how rapidly the uh, the pressure is building? Oh, Peter, thanks. Um... Yeah, I, I'm positively surprised that since about six months, 12 months, we've seen more and more requests from smaller, larger, medium-sized companies showing a big interest in this subject. Uh, compared to two years ago, uh, when you had tenders, if you started to talk about it on the side, uh, there was a certain yes, request, we need also some CO2 data. Nowadays, we see that all of a sudden we are, we are talking to sustainability people. So besides the logistics people, the sustainability people in the companies uh, sitting with us in QBR sessions, in larger meetings, I attend a lot of these meetings in the last six months, and that's amazing to see how uh, things are progressing in this respect. So I'm very happy in this respect uh, that we're also having the session here today. It shows us uh, that there's a big interest in this, and uh, we, I would have loved to be uh, at the TPM in March with you on the subject. We've always discussed this at length. Uh, so, but yeah. finally, we do it here. No, indeed, Otto. And uh, but but what you're what you're really saying here is that the interest is 
genuine, but also very recent. And, and from the perspective of, of TPM, I can certainly agree with that because this past March was to have been the 20th TPM. And believe me, over the years, we have tried to hold many decarbonization sessions at TPM, and the only common characteristic would be that the room was empty. But this past year, we were going to put that subject right on the big stage and talk about it in a very big way. Uh, and when we do the virtual TPM, which we're going to have to do virtually back in March, it's also going to be a very big subject. Uh, Sanjay, tur turning to you, uh, it, are you seeing the same thing? Are, are you uh, now, I mean, when you look at, at, at Maersk, uh, you know, obviously you guys are to be applauded for the, the commitments that you have made, uh, which uh, go beyond uh, almost anybody else in the maritime industry. But, but it also seems like it's being led by you. Uh, or is that wrong? Are you being led by shippers in making the ambitious commitments that, that you folks have made as an organization? I think you have a very interesting question over there. Firstly, I would like to agree with uh, what Peter and uh, Otto and you, how you summarized it. As the last 12 months, uh, we have seen a significant shift in terms of how the interest from consumers have actually translated to brands and therefore translated to supply chain managers and therefore uh, to the to the logistics industry in terms of doing something more with uh, within the decarbonization. We in Musk uh, we set out a, uh, a very ambitious goal at the end of 2018 to say we will go uh, net zero by 2050. And that at the time was actually seen as a, a really bold and ambitious statement. But if you look around right now, there are a number of companies which are also coming around to realize that that needs to be the real ambition and not... Um, say a marginal increase or a, an efficiency improvement alone will not deal with the matter. So we're seeing an activism within, within the industry. We're seeing a lot of interest in the shippers. I just feel you, you mentioned about our leadership. So, so in uh, 2019, we actually launched this, uh, the first product on uh, zero carbon shipping called Eco Delivery. And the consumption of that from the shipper community has been very, like, uh, to put it rightly, possibly surprising to us. We wouldn't have expected that, I would say, two years ago. So, yes, mm -hmm. there is components coming together. And I think to your questions that you actually put out today, the key component is how do we go from here in a collaborative way to make sure this really happens. Yep, Sanjay, it's 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 very interesting, and and I think that one of the one of the ways that we're beginning to see uh, evidence of uh, of of shippers coming to the table and engaging on 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 decarbonization is around data, and and Otto, you folks at at Kuna Naval have been leaders in this area uh, in terms of bringing to uh, uh, bringing to customers. Uh, uh, Data that that reveals, for for example, which which services are the most carbon intensive and which are the the, the least carbon intensive. Uh, to to what degree do you see uh, data as as driving uh, this dialogue forward and and um, you know make, making it easier in some ways for for shippers to be able to engage in this subject by being able to measure uh, in a, in a more tangible way the uh, the carbon footprint of their supply chains. No, I think that data is key to all trades. Huh? We started to, to measure, uh, and not only we, I think a lot of companies uh, in their sustainability reports uh, were uh, asked to, to report their CO2 emissions. And, and uh, in, when it came to transportation, there was not enough data available. And we started to concentrate on this a couple of years ago. We were... And we did this to create internally and later also uh, externally a certain awareness. By the way, for instance, all CO2 emissions per transport which we handled on the invoice. So we have this on the invoice already since three, four years in sea freight. We are now extending this to, to air freight and also overland. So that create a certain awareness. Now, later, the next step would be that we, we uh, don't only have for the for each individual move, but the shippers can also compare the CO2 emissions between two slings because this industry between two vessels to two slings and the Trans-Pacific, Asia, Europe, whatever trade you take, there are huge differences between various services. When you take the automotive industry, the difference between two cars is not so extreme. In it can be even 300%. And that visibility, creating that visibility, which we, we, we put together on in a platform, we might talk about that later on, 
creating this awareness. And that's where we get a lot of good feedback from customers say, uh, for the first time, somebody is making all this very visible. Because overall, container shipping is about 200 billion tons of CO2 worldwide. Uh, but that's an average number per carrier. Uh, the carriers are reporting their numbers. But when you break it down per trade, per vessel, the difference, as I said, are very big. Indeed, very good. And I've seen some of that data, Otto. You've, you've shared it with me, and it's 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 pretty stark. Uh, some of the uh, information that, that you've been able to reveal, uh, Boris. If we if we were to turn to you, I mean, you know, how, how do you view this discussion? Do you see a uh, a groundswell of uh, of interest just among uh, among consumers? Because we're really talking here in in the container supply chain world. Uh, we're, we're talking about, as I had mentioned at the at the beginning of the webinar, you know, the most direct connection that exists in between uh, the shipping industry and the and you know your average person, uh, you know your your average consumer. I mean, do do you feel that the that that consumers are beginning to have a, a greater appreciation for the for the climate emergency that we're facing, and and can you see greater pressure from consumers beginning to manifest itself uh, in coming years? Yes, absolutely. Uh, I think that the uh, that the uh, that the pressure uh, from the consumer side is there. It's it's evident. And uh, uh, Otto mentioned that um, uh, he told me also some. He explained me some examples that are pretty astonishing. And um, through our collaboration, I was able to to follow some of the discussions with uh, some customers even. And uh, I was really surprised seeing how progressive some of the, um, the consumer brands are. Um, and, uh, and I think there's a, there's a tremendous uh, urgency in the, in the uh, shipping industry, but of course in the whole logistics industry to, um, to offer, to go, come up with good offers. And, uh, and um, that's quite interesting to see uh, that Maersk is thinking 10 years from now, the first Jewish investor, then I find that very, very inspiring, and that uh, that gives a lot of hope. Um, because where we save carbon, carbon emissions, that doesn't really that doesn't really matter. We just need to save them. And uh, if we have one ship to start with, then um, customers uh, can buy certificates, and we can start a trade of decarbonized uh, container shipping, for example, which Kuhn and Nagel is already doing. Um, with some uh, alternative fuels, and um, yeah, I'm as a as a consumer, I would be uh, I would be willing to pay that little extra for knowing that uh, the carbon footprint of my product is uh, very very low. Very good, Boris. Thank you. I mean, if we were to ask, I mean, is sustainability the next frontier in supply chains? I mean. I mean, I mean, I mean, Peter. As you uh, as you further develop your decarbonization initiatives uh, within the uh, the framework of the Global Maritime Forum, can you can you see can you envision that that uh, that a uh, that, an, that an agenda that is specifically driven out of the container world and particularly shippers could emerge and and could could play a a, a meaningful role in in the dialogue about about how we go forward from here. Yes, I think it could. I think it should. Uh, I think it's important. Um, as I said, the you know the problem is that the um, the shipper community is so dispersed, it's so broad um, that uh, we need to find a way of engaging um, prominent shippers, representatives of, of of shipper associations in a way in which, uh, similar to that in which um, the bulk cargo owners have come together in the Sea Cargo Charter. Um, it's interesting, you know, as Boris just said, I think consumers certainly would be prepared to pay the extra cost because it is very small in terms of the extra cost uh, to, the, to the consumer good, the price of the consumer good that would be involved in the decarbonization process as, as it would affect um, container ships. The problem is that for the carrier, for the, for the common carrier, and let's, let's face it, for the past 50 years, container shipping lines have not covered their cost of capital for most of that period. They're doing quite nicely this year, uh, ironically, in a year in which 
um, many others are not doing so well. Um, but you know that is where the burden, the uh, the capital burden, will initially fall, and it will be heavy for them. But if it's if it is um, adequately supported across the supply chain, across the finance chain, across the insurance chain, uh, and indeed facilitated through the use of a carbon levy or whatever it may be, so that first movers uh, can be incentivized to um, invest in what will be untried vessels, I mean, te untried technology to some extent, um, and indeed in, in supporting the investment in infrastructure, in bunkering infrastructure that will be involved. That is what needs to be worked out. And ultimately, that needs to be supported by the end users. And there, you know, in terms of the cost at the end of the, at the, end of the line, the end of the delivery process, it's quite small. But at the point at which the investment has to be made, it's very large. So that is what needs to be, um, if you like, the uh, uh, the barrier. Uh, that's the barrier that needs to be overcome. Yeah, it's it's it's, it's a hugely important point that that you make, Peter, because uh, the the you're 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 absolutely correct that the container carriers have failed to return uh, adequate profits to their to their shareholders over many years. This year, kind of being a sort of a rare exception. Uh, and uh, there's a lot of speculation right now about to what degree the the, the positive financial results that, that the ocean carriers are experiencing this year is is sustainable over the medium or, or long term. But nevertheless, uh, the the, uh, the 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 uh, the, 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 the failure, if you will, to achieve adequate re returns by the container lines, all that just does is is accrue to the benefit of their customers. The customers have gotten. Uh, have, have benefited from from low cost transportation uh, at the expense of the providers of that transportation, uh, and I'm not moralizing about it, saying it's good or bad or, or anything like that. It's just it's just the reality. But that construct does not work in in this uh, in this environment that you are describing here. Uh, that that the investment that's going to be required in order to decarbonize container shipping, in particular. Uh, is uh, cannot be done on the back of of, of the of the container carriers uh, solely, and 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 that's a, a realization and a and a reality that that the industry is going to have to come face to face with. Um, I mean, Sanjay, is that a, is that a fair statement from 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 your position? Obviously, uh, as the world's largest ocean carrier. Yeah, I think what Peter said in terms of the shippers in the shipping community, whether that's uh, carriers or logistics players, need to come together to this. Absolutely. We have to be able to incentivize the right kind of innovation, the right kind of commitments and investments that are required to build the solution of the future. I mean, if you just you know, you imagine the world uh, about 10 years from now, right? And you can already hear the signs of it today. The consumers are actually the ones who are crying out loudest. You haven't heard it today, but uh, already there will be soon enough zero carbon SKUs in our stores. There will be uh, the push for having a zero carbon footprint on every person, that will translate to the trans. That will then translate to the supply chains and naturally the carriers. So the forwards are there coming. What we need is a framework and a lot of supporting structures to actually ensure that the investments that we make today are actually into the right buckets and actually furnish the discovery of the solutions of the future. Collaboration is the key and the structures like what the um, since uh, uh, the Global Maritime Forum, collaborations like what we do with uh, um, the GMF and other uh, other coalitions like uh, the Clean Cargo, for instance, uh, where we bring the shippers and the ship shipping uh, businesses together. And that's really where the magic happens, where one pressurizes the other and actually incentivizes the other to build the solutions of the future. I mean, that's what's created the... The ambitions that's what created the first uh, zero carbon product as well today. Th thank you, Sanjay. I mean, Otto, from your point of view, I mean, you know, shippers have long viewed uh, ocean transportation as an opportunity to drive down cost. And now here, what we're saying is that, is that decarbonization and container shipping is not achievable uh, uh, at, at, at a low cost, that there, that there has to be uh, 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 the sort of a commitment um, from shippers to uh, to make this happen. And, and Boris, you said, that, that from a from a consumer point of view, why wouldn't people uh, consumers be willing to pay more for a uh, for a zero carbon product uh, if, uh, if 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 that's what if that's what they want? 
Um, so do you, how much of a challenge, Otto, do you, do you see this as, uh, as we, you know, get closer and closer to uh, having to resolve this in one way or another? That's actually the other good news. So, uh, we, we are not only seeing that uh, we talk more to sustainability people in general, uh, what we discussed in the beginning of our conversation, but we are now starting to talk to customers about what alternatives are there and how much would this cost. And we are cooperating closely with various carriers, including Maersk and other carriers, and selling biofuel, which is not available in large scale, but it's, it's there, so second-grade biofuel, which costs quite a bit more. And if you would have asked me three months ago, I would have said perhaps we can get uh, next year, in the coming 12 months, three, four customers on board buying biofuel, so being 100% carbon neutral right from the beginning. Now we have a every week more and more interest in this because people say i would as a brand especially brand companies i have an advantage over my competition if i can show that my for instance supply chain is uh, carbon neutral mm -hmm. and i always saying uh, if the first one starts to move on this subject the first brand and uh, if you take one German uh, sports shoemaker and one American sports shoemaker whoever starts first with this the other will follow within a minute because there will be so much better, uh, from the consumer. And in the end, on the pair of shoes, when you increase the container by five, six, seven hundred dollars, it's not really any money on the pair of shoes. So the consumer will drive this and carry it. That's why I always tell carriers, don't be afraid for these investments in the end. And that's what Boris was referring to when shouldn't we have the first vessels if Maersk has the first vessel available, which will cost more in 2030 and hopefully perhaps even earlier. And then if you want to book on that vessel, you have to pay five, six, seven hundred dollars more per container. And there will be enough customers who are willing to pay for this. I'm 100 percent convinced about that. Otto, can you just explain briefly how this will work in practice? Uh, are there going to be specific ships that will use biofuel and it will be the uh, the, the merchandise of those uh, customers who are committing to a zero carbon supply chain whose, whose cargo or whose containers will be on that ship? I mean, how will it, uh, how will it uh, you know, practically work? Oh, I think that uh, Merce can also explain uh, explain this. What carriers are doing, actually, we they buy on our behalf biofuel and inject it into their fleet for the transport modes where we are selling it to customers. So it does not necessarily mean that if you book as a customer from Shanghai to uh, Southampton or from Shanghai to Los Angeles a container, that on that specific vessel the biofuel was used. It was used somewhere in the fleet of that carrier, and the emissions which would have been taking place between Shanghai and Los Angeles were offset because somebody paid for this. It's the same thing what we can do privately. The first airlines are offering this also. So airlines, uh, you buy synthetic fuels, you pay more for your ticket, and the airline is then injecting that portion which they bought on behalf of you somewhere into their fleet. Right. So it's almost like it's not a, you know, it's it's a step forward from the sort of traditional offset, and and, it, and it's creating greater proximity uh, between the uh, the use of the zero carbon fuel and the transport of the goods, although it's not quite direct. It's it's the both the both the offsetting and the biofuel are interim solutions to technology to carriers to shipyards to the uh, the big oil companies who are working on it getting away from the carbon fuels, uh, coming up with ammonia, synthetic fuels, et cetera, and what uh, Peter was talking about. And this hopefully will be there by 2030, first vessels, et cetera. So we, we need interim solutions. And these interim solutions, we, we do a lot of offsetting, and a lot of people talk about greenwashing, but we believe it's better than doing nothing because the CO2 is still there. Biofuel is the next level, which is more expensive. So Customers are getting used to it. So I'm very optimistic, and that's why we set ourselves a very clear target that by 2030, we want to have all our shipments worldwide under scope three for sea freight, air freight to be carbon neutral. And in the end, the shipper has to pay for this. Because, and in the end, not only the shipper, the consumer behind it. And the consumer will pay for this. Mm -hmm. and, and, uh, and Sanjay, from, from, uh, from your point of view at Maersk, how quickly of an uptake are, are you expecting? I mean, to, uh, to what degree are you planning as a company for, for this transition to occur uh, that, that Otto is describing? 
I think you used the right word, transition. So it's 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 a journey from here towards that net zero position. And we're talking about vessels which are fully carbon neutral, but we're not yet there, right? Because that's that's almost a decade out, uh, at least as per current vision. And it could actually be pulled forward if we are if we set our minds towards it. Um, and we are able to actually innovate towards it. But before that, we have steps in between where the biodiesel uh, solution today is actually able to make the fleet greener. I mean, just as an example, just think about uh, how we actually use our electricity right now. There are different sources when we actually uh, pull the electricity into the grid. Some are green and some are not. But as the num uh, number of sources of the green uh, electricity actually uh, increases, the whole network becomes greener. That's the whole aspect right now. To move into an intermediate state where the, the, the carbon footprint of the fleet is actually going down. That's what we're working on right now. But as we move, we will also figure out that there are uh, fuels which can actually do this even more sustainably than biodiesel could ever do. Um, there, are, uh, there are conversations around uh, ammonia, the conversations around uh, alcohol-based fuels, all of which we are, we are actively considering and mm -hmm. co-innovating, even with our customer base. So, so this is actually a, a journey into the future and uh, how early the first ship could be ready, that's anyone's guess, but uh, we're, we're actually now working towards uh, doing uh, a single uh, vessel uh, into the market at the earliest possible time, but that innovation is going on. Understood, understood. Um, you know, uh, Boris, uh, uh, Sanjay is talking about different, different fuel types. Otto was talking about different fuel types. Uh, I mean, one of the things that we've seen a bit of, a bit of media about over the past couple of weeks is sail. And, uh, you know, of course, you know, sail was how ships got around for a long, long time before the uh, before the, the, the steam engine came along. And now uh, now we're starting to see, uh, the, I think, the real possibility that that within the next, you know, however many years we may see sailing ships yet again. Uh, you're a sailor. Uh, you obviously see the benefits of sail because you're about to get on your boat and sail around the world. Uh, and, and you, you know, you're going to be under sail power the entire time. So do you think sail has a, uh, uh, has a place in cargo transportation? Yes, Peter, I think so, because uh, if we imagine um, net zero emission vessels, um, the fuel will be uh, quite expensive. Um, the fuel infrastructure and everything around it. So the, the biggest hurdle for any wind propulsion uh, or wind-assisted propulsion today is that it's economically not really viable. It's an extra investment and it doesn't really, um, it doesn't really return on the investment. But <clears throat> if the fuel price of the fuel that we use for these specific vessels is that much higher, then in the business case of such a ship, of um, emission neutral ship, uh, I think then uh, additional wind assisted propulsion can become economically viable. And we will not see the square rigger. We will not see uh, the romantic sail clause in the air. We will probably see some kind of uh, telescopical wings uh, that are very industrial, that are fully remote controlled, that are fully automated, um, that will not have anything to do with uh, really my uh, my daily life as a sailor. But of course, as a sailor, harnessing the power of nature for me is the most important thing. And that we, sh we need to do for the zero emission, um, not the zero emission, but the emission neutral vessels. And that's what we do with the fuels as, as well. I mean, where does the emission neutral fuel come from? It comes from, it comes from nature, it comes from renewable energies, or it has to come. And so we use some of the wind power at sea in a wind farm, at, on land in a wind farm, to create uh, some some kind of um, fuels. And then we use also, hopefully, some wind at sea on certain routes, uh, logically not on every route, but on specific routes. I could imagine that, for example, North Atlantic trade could be such a route uh, where you can have 10, 15, 20, 30% extra propulsion and fuel savings from uh, wind power. And considering the cost of that um, emission neutral fuel, that could be economically viable, I think. Uh, Sanjay, how do you folks at, at Maersk view sale? Are you, do, do you see a, a, a value in what Boris is saying? Do you, do you, can you see uh, sale power as being part of the mix of, uh, of zero 
carbon uh, uh, propulsion in your fleet in the future? Uh, well, at the moment, uh, our best bets are right now looking at alternative fuels, and that still remains, like I said, um, starting with the biodiesel, but actually looking forward towards uh, ammonia and alcohol-based fuels. But there are a number of other alternatives which are being in consideration, including sales, uh, but this is, our, this is our point of view. Understood. So I, I want to kind of move the, this conversation into into what 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 companies can practically do. I mean, you're a retail brand, you're a consumer brand. Uh, we have many of those companies uh, who are who are with us today, and, and thank you all in the audience for for joining us. And we'll get to some questions too. Uh, we'll have a little bit of time in a few minutes to get to some of your questions. Uh, but what do you, what did what do they do? What do shippers do, practically speaking? Uh, certainly. Uh, uh, engaging in conversations with with their carriers, with their with their forwarders, uh, uh, you know, getting involved uh, in other ways. But but what, what's your what's what's your advice, um, Otto, to to shippers? To how do you incorporate a sustainability uh, decarbonization strategy into your uh, into your overall approach to supply chain? Oh, we are we are telling customers let's first measure it. And so we're educating customers uh, on, on, on the visibility. So what, what we talked earlier about, how much CO2 actually is in the supply chain. Then how much can we reduce it by switching transport modes? Why doing, instead of only air freight, you go for air sea, or you, you go from air to sea freight. So there you can do, of course, already, you can have major reductions. Uh, or like I said earlier, we, we by using our platforms, going from one service to another service. Then the next thing is the biofuels as one example. So once you have done all this, then you discuss with the customer, let's have a strategy where you, what's the benefit? We, only, we don't want to be only be good doers, and that we, we sleep better, but perhaps the customer can have an advantage over his competition. So we are now having discussions with the first brands. Why don't you promote what you do well, and then you become better than your competitor? And so the, the, there's one brand in Europe which I admire, uh, which is uh, Oatly, it's, it's a Swedish company, and they put now on their packaging its milk, uh, haver milk, and they put all CO2 emissions on that package check. And they put as a slogan on there, hey, show me your numbers. So they want to force the competition that everybody puts it on his, on, on the package check. And uh, this is a small startup company, very popular, I think also in the US, and actually Blackstone invested into it only because of the sustainability policy of this company. So I think next year we would see a lot of brands saying, hey, I can have a competitive advantage by becoming more transparent on this subject. Yeah, very, very good, uh, Otto. And, and Peter, from, from from your point of view, as uh, sort of at the at the confluence of, of of carriers and shippers and government agencies and sort of and financiers and and, and insurance, uh, how, how do you what what would be your uh, statement to you know a Walmart or a Target or an Aldi or uh, you know, uh, an IKEA, big big container shippers who 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 have substantial volumes of of, of cargo, or even mid sized shippers in terms of, you know, they're they're hearing the demands of their of the of their customers. Uh, they, this is part of the conversation now, whereas even just a year ago or two years ago, it was not part of the conversation. What's your advice to them? Well, look, I I think there is a, you know, there's a model out there. There are precedents out there. Um, the Poseidon principles, um, whereby the the major regulated banks and least financiers that uh, finance the shipping industry have come together and established a set of principles um, by which they will, as it were, assess their customers, the, their borrowers. Uh, and they will do that by insisting that um, their borrowers report to them uh, their carbon alignment, their climate alignment, their carbon footprint, uh, and the measure being used is the AER at the moment. Um, and customers who don't, borrowers who don't report that information, duly verified by classification societies and under the auspices of the IMO, will not get a look in. They will not be considered uh, as customers of the bank. Now, customers that have a bad 
um, carbon footprint uh, as distinct from a good one will not immediately be um, excluded, but they will be judged over time according to their uh, performance by reference to the trajectory which the IMO uh, has set out leading up to 2050. Similarly, the Sea Cargo Charter, the, the signatories to that, um, they are going to be judging their uh, carriers in relation to their disclosure. They will also insist on similar disclosure, although under the Sea Cargo Charter, it will be an operational measure rather than the AER, it will be the EOI. Um, but it's the same principle. Now, as I said, it's more difficult with the shippers because there are so many of them. But on the other hand, if um, an association could be brought together, which would bring in the major names that you described and others, plus other associations, plus freight forwarders, uh, and develop a similar set of principles based upon verified measurements, because Otto is absolutely right, in order to do anything you have to measure first, then the pressure starts to build. And as that group, as that, as it were, industry leading group grows and grows and grows, then others will increasingly follow. And you're absolutely right. All of these companies, uh, their shareholders are investment institutions, which themselves are under increasing pressure to um, judge their investment uh, criteria according to ESG factors. Um, and, and environment is probably the leading one, but it's not the only one. So the pressure is there. Uh, I think it would be perfectly logical, uh, but as I say, not easy, to create something similar to the Poseidon principles in the Sea Cargo Charter uh, uh, for the shipper, shipper community. And uh, personally, I think that would be a, a very healthy development. Well. Peter, coming from you, that's a pretty significant statement. That's a challenge to the shippers of containers to organize themselves in a way that uh, could uh, it, get us to the goal uh, more quickly by uh, leveraging the, 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 the power and influence that, that they have in the container market. Uh, so uh, so I think that's, that's very interesting. I mean, uh, Sanjay, from, from your point of view, I mean, you know, like I like I had said earlier, from you know, you know, Maersk had really taken seem, seemingly taken the initiative not on its own, but but without obvious pressure from customers, almost ahead of customers. Uh, would would you welcome the uh, a, a collective voice of customers in uh, in in insisting on uh, 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 data and insisting on metrics and uh, uh, you know? Their their association being based on 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 a, on a set of principles in terms of expectations for the container carriers uh, as as a vehicle to uh, move uh, this this whole process forward. Absolutely, not only would we welcome, we would also love to facilitate such a move. I mean, think about the the consumer and the customer brands and the customer brands that we're speaking about, right? They are, uh, they are in the world where they have to furnish. It's become more uh, expensive to, be, to, to stay uh, with a huge carbon footprint and stay unsustainable. It's becoming more and more important to showcase and to ensure that the reality actually checks in, that they are moving on the decarbonization front. For our, from our perspective, that's actually um, what we want to hear more and more from our customers. It's trickling down from a company strategy to the sustain, uh, to the supply chain strategy as well. And more of the customers that I'm not speaking to are willing to open doors and, uh, and like Otto was saying, to speak in a much more senior and partnership oriented way to actually get there. Um, what we're doing is trying to advise them. You asked also about, uh, about what would be uh, a good move to actually take it forward. What's coming up very clearly in this conversation at least is that one, you have to have that goal and ambition to go there. And I think more and more of the companies are having that. We also need a deliberate strategy to go there, which means that it needs to be a measure, there needs to be a roadmap, and there needs to be a way of collaborating and, and acting upon to do that. To take one specific example, uh, I mentioned about clean cargo. What we're doing there is actually bringing the shippers and the shipping lines and uh, the logistics partners like uh, Kieran Nagel themselves into a singular forum where we can actually 
decipher what is the right set of principles, framework to ensure um, the decarbonization agenda gets moved forward, how to advise uh, the shipper community to actually move forward from you know, the exploratory stage to see what needs to be done towards the leadership or the adopter stage, wherein they are able to put some of these principles in practice. So yes, we would welcome up to facilitate. Good, thank, thank you, Sanjay. And I, I, I just want to say one thing first, which is please, uh, uh, if, if you, you, those of you in the audience would like to ask some questions, if you could enter them into the uh, into the question uh, uh, box, and then you know, in a few minutes, we'll we'll try to we'll try to get to a couple of your questions. Uh, I mean, Boris, I want I want to get back to you, and I kind of want to take a status check here. Uh, I mean, there was a uh, an interim, what's called an intersessional meeting of the IMO that just took place within the last few weeks. Uh, the uh, the what was agreed to and what came out of that meeting was uh, bitterly criticized by environmentalists as uh, as 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 weak, as uh, noncommittal, as slow, uh, and uh, even to the point where uh, environmentalists, uh, some of them at least, uh, uh, questioned whether the IMO at a multilateral level can even drive forward the uh, the, the decarbonization of the shipping industry. Um, uh, from your point of view, uh, as a committed environmentalist um, and uh, as, a, as, a, as a high profile person in the sailing world, um, you're listening to this dialogue here. And uh, how, how is it how, how is it resonating with you? Is uh, are we just sort of talking around the issue? Are we not getting to the heart of the issue? Are, are we not being bold enough or uh, are you encouraged by what you're saying, hearing or somewhere in between? I'm definitely encouraged. Uh, we have a very particular group uh, around uh, the table today, and uh, I'm uh, very privileged to, to be talking to you today. I will leave in only four days for a nonstop race around the world. And in the, in the few moments I will have to, to think about outside my, my daily business on the race, uh, this will resonate with me. And uh, I, I already took away from this conversation a lot of key facts, and I think there's a jigsaw coming together from each of the panelists' uh, statements. Uh, Peter was mentioning a barrier that we have to break on the investment side, a, a zero emission car, um, a zero carbon uh, cargo vessel is a huge investment. But if we combine the different uh, industry insights from, let's say, from auto, where we know we can uh, we can start. Uh, we we can um, we can sell to a customer uh, a container service uh, on a totally different route and use the funds that we generate there for offering um, uh, zero carbon. We can use these funds towards our uh, zero emission or zero carbon uh, vessel into another at, an, at a totally different um, in a different region in the world. So these can be um, can be. Um, we had people with the energy grid, with the electrical grid. I found that a very good example. Uh, we can do start something similar. And I think the role of Maersk uh, is very important there and, and, and hopefully others. Um, bringing such ships to life will help also the industry because that, that is creating the demand that is necessary to also start that industry. Uh, I find that is a... Uh, a, a very important role. And I think you, you were starting your question with the IMO. Uh, maybe we should not try to fix everything at once with the one fits all solution. I think on different geographical areas, different um, zones, we will have different fuels, different possibilities to use wind power or renewable energies, um, and um, totally different restrictions in harbors and so on. So there will probably be very uh, uh, scattered solutions, and maybe that's that's a, a good thinking to step forward here. What I would urge you to do is start start with one vessel here, then a second vessel there, and so on. Let's bring these solutions to life. I really uh, deeply wish to see uh, those uh, those solutions coming online, and I think it will be very fascinating for the generation to come of nautical personnel of people around these uh, logistic uh, challenges and the engineers involved and all that it will be a very fantastic challenging time well thank you thank, thank you boris and uh we we 
I, th I think need to be challenged uh, uh, by, by you uh, and and inspired by by you. And, and I'm going to, like I said at the beginning, I'm going to give you the last few minutes of this webinar to just kind of sum this all up. Uh, you know, on the on the you know, essentially on the eve of of, of your of your great of your great journey, uh, I, I want to turn to a few a few questions um, uh, from 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 the audience, uh, and um, uh, 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 you know, one one question concerns um, uh, you know, in the spirit of of promoting sustainability, I mean. Uh, are you as a as a freight forwarder or as an ocean carrier? So this is really uh, uh, directed at at uh, Sanjay and Otto. Um, are you willing to provide priority to customers who have made commitments to sustainability? Uh, I mean, you know, we're we're increasingly seeing uh, 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 cut, cut container shipping customers uh, want priority uh, because e commerce supply chains uh, uh, demand uh, uh, a fa fast movement. They demand visibility. They uh, increasingly large sh shippers want to have their containers be the first ones to be, the last ones to be loaded, the first ones to be unloaded, the first ones to be sent out of the terminal and onto the distribution center. Uh, but what happens if you're a, a customer of of Kuninagel or a customer of Maersk, and I'm and I've made commitments uh, ahead of my peers? Uh, do, do, are are you going to look at me in a in a, in a positive way uh, relative to other customers? I think it's a terrific question. Um, uh, Sanjay, you want to you want to take a, a, a shot at that, and maybe we can we can ask Otto as well. Sure. Yeah. If if, if you look at it, uh, like I said earlier, when a customer actually is prepared to go the full mile with us um, on sustainability, that means they are ready to co-create with us, innovate with us. They're ready to place the bets where uh, we're looking to in terms of uh, decarbonizing the oceans and uh, the shipping lines. So which essentially means that we look at the customer also from a partnership uh, line of uh, thinking, which means from our love, uh, world, we want to reward those partnership customers with the priority access that we can give them. So absolutely, raising that uh, that lens in terms of uh, the partnership and the commitment uh, from both sides deserves, uh, deserves a relook at that, uh, the priority, and that should be the way that we should actually do business, to do it together mm -hmm. for the greater good. Mm -hmm. Otto, how do you see it? I, I think a very good question. Uh, I like the question. I have to think about it more also for future, especially right now as we have uh, we have a tight vessel situation and a lot of trades worldwide. And why shouldn't one give people who have very good sustainability goals and are willing to pay for this priority over other people? That could be a very good thing. And. Uh, no, I, I like it. We, in the, I can only echo what Sanjay was saying. Of course, uh, when, when you start such a discussion in general with the customer, or already you talk about the partnership. But even in today's times, if somebody says, I'm willing to pay extra for this because I, I need extra space, but I'm also willing to pay for, because my sustainability goals, uh, I, I'm, I set very tough goals myself. The company has set them. Why should we prioritize those customers? Definitely, it creates more competition, and competition is always good in this respect. Very good. And Otto, a question also that came for you is, uh, and I think you may have answered it before, but I'm but I'm not sure. Is what what are the decarbonization commitments of uh, of, of Conan Agel, and and you know where where do you folks want to get to uh, as a company by when? Okay, we. we uh, what we have decided, so scope one and two, and of course we are in a different position than, for instance, most client or an airline, as we do not have really any uh, assets uh, which produce a lot of CO2, so no vessels, no planes, uh, and even the trucks we mostly do not own. So they all fall under scope three, but our scope one and two, which are all our own emissions, which we control directly, so in all buildings, warehouses worldwide, where we cannot buy yet renewable energy, and we have reduced those emissions quite a bit, but that's still around 300,000 tons of CO2. And we committed ourselves that as of this year, we are offsetting all those emissions. Uh, so under scope one and two, we are carbon neutral. Uh, airlines have done similar things. I think British Airways and Lufthansa is looking into this. So Air France did the same thing. So we don't we can't get rid of those emissions yet. And scope three, which are the emissions of the carriers, where we know, where we are optimistic, they will do something about it, but this will last. We want to offset those latest by 2030. 
so by 2030, we want to be also under a scope three carbon control. Okay, that's a very ambitious goal, Otto. I think that that, answer, that answers the question uh, uh, very, very well. Um, so uh, I think to to conclude our webinar, first of all, thank you to all of our speakers. Uh, greatly appreciate you participating, and this has really been a very, a very interesting, very thought provoking uh, dialogue. It feels very new. It feels as if things are really beginning to move. It feels as if there's really some some great potential for some significant initiative in this in this area, and all all of that is all of that is very very exciting and very and very promising. Uh, and uh, and 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 Boris, and especially thank you to you. Uh, you. You're obviously very busy, just a few days away from uh, from 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 your departure for the solo round the world race. And uh, first of all, I think that on behalf of all of us, uh, uh, good luck, uh, wishing you well, uh, rooting you on. Um, and uh, very much looking forward to following your your progress, which which I'm sure that that we'll be able to do via electronic means. And so, Boris, to to finish us off uh, today, uh, and maybe to inspire us to greatness, I wanted to turn it over to you and uh, and and thank you all, and thank and, th and thank everybody else again. Yes, yeah, uh, thank you all too, and thank you, Peter. Um, I'm setting off this Sunday. Um, to a very particular race, probably one of the most difficult sporting challenges that exists on our planet today. I'm going to sail alone, nonstop around the world. Uh, that takes about 80 days on the race yacht that you see here on the picture on the slide. Uh, it is a, a high-tech vessel. It has hydrofoils. It, it can semi-fly over the ocean, so it's not really a sailing boat. It is more like a bizarre kind of vehicle on the ocean, probably uh, something a bit futuristic in terms of sailing. Um, and uh, we go at an average speed of uh, 17, 18 knots. We go uh, around the world without any fossil fuel. So I, uh, propuls propulsion comes from the wind alone, of course. And all the onboard systems and electronics are powered by solar power and and uh, and things like that. So um, for me, it's an incredible metaphor in inspiring myself over and over again to see I can go on the longest possible route around our planet uh, pretty damn fast without using any any engine, any any fossil fuel. And um, and that's really something I saw. I mean, for me, it's a it's a lifetime dream. It is a sport challenge first of all. It's a race. Uh, it is also an adventure, an adventure, but also I want to promote the message: we are in this race against time. And uh, so I would conclude on coming back to that that started our our discussion today. And thank you very much for the discussion. I've learned a lot. Um, we are in a race against time to to find solutions on every level for climate change. There's not one solution that will fix it all. There will be many different solutions, and um, we really have to hurry. Um, what I read the other day was that we need to reduce emissions every year by 7%. So that is um, an extent of a change that we can probably compare to the first industrial revolution, when we first started using coal. And I hope that <clears throat> the things that Otto mentioned, like a compensation, but also a trade scheme, trade scheme for zero carbon um, services, uh, a trade scheme for carbon neutrality, that can be like the new coal, and that can trigger a whole new economy. And that can also facilitate the investments needed in the infrastructure for these new fuels and for these cargo vessels that I dream of when I'm at sea alone out there. Then, uh, and I see myself going at 20 or even 30 knots boat speed, which is 70 kilometers an hour over the sea. Then I dream of a cargo vessel that could also use the power of nature in a sustainable way. It is a challenge for all of us, but we, we need to understand the nature of this race. We need to be optimistic. And I hear in these discussions of the IMO and other forums and the webinars, I hear a lot of problems are uh, being discussed. But let's see them as challenges, I would say. Uh, let's be optimist and let's, kind, let's try to create solutions what I really appreciate in the shipping industry, where I, I'm, 
lucky to have uh, to do with a lot with our partners. They are all doers, the people I met. And Otto is a doer, for example, but many of the other partners that support our projects, um, things are happening at pace quite often in shipping. And I think also the idea was um, a zero carbon vessel that can hopefully happen at pace. And I think once you bring these solutions to life, you come to the market with these solutions, the financial industry will be a big supporter. There's tremendous interest, of course, with the ESG finance sector. Um, there's huge demand. Otto gave the example with Blackstone investing in this one company specifically for their sustainability uh, strategy. <clears throat> um, this taken into account, all these puzzle uh, pieces taken into account, uh, that makes me optimistic. And I'm really hoping that we, uh, with, that this transition doesn't take 10 years, uh, doesn't take 20 years, but it rather takes five to 10 years. And then in 10 years, we really see a number of vessels uh, going zero cup. Thank, thank you, Boris. Uh, thank, you, thank, thank you so much. Thank you for joining us. Uh, Otto, thank you. Uh, Peter and Sanjay, thank you. Thank you all so much. Really interesting dialogue. Thank you all in our audience for joining us today. I hope that you found this interesting, mm -hmm. and uh, and and we'll uh, we'll end it here. Thank you very much. Thank you.